Thank you. Just just uh, for the folks in the back of the room, if I speak at this volume, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you. Um, first, I want to I want to thank Chris for the opportunity to to speak today, and and certainly to congratulate. Imperial on the establishment of the network. I, th I think the concentration of talent and resources here at Imperial is, is really second to none, and the opportunities for multidisciplinary crosstalk uh, are tremendous. And I think it's, it's very exciting for me as the head of an organization like CEPI to know that, that Imperial is, is bringing together its, its researchers, its scientists, its academics, its engineers. Uh, to address problems of vaccine development. I look forward to, to working with the network. Uh, and I want to also uh, chastise Professor Weber, um, who, in saying that he is likes uh, anniversaries, neglected to mention 2018 as the anniversary of the Spanish influenza. <laughs> and uh, uh, obviously, that's an anniversary that, that I have focused uh, Quite a bit on this year because it, I think it speaks to the potential of epidemic diseases in modern societies to to really cause carnage. Um, Chris mentioned that I am trained as a medical oncologist, um, and I, I, I do bring a, a, a somewhat multidisciplinary perspective to the to the issue of vaccine development. I used to work at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, was there when Jim Allison. Uh, who was just awarded the Nobel Prize with Hanji Tasuku uh, for their work on checkpoint inhibitors, was uh, working very closely uh, with clinicians to, to do some of the first clinical trials of ipilimumab, which was, which was a uh, checkpoint inhibitor uh, that, in, in conjunction with some of the other checkpoint inhibitors that have subsequently been developed, has really unlocked immunotherapy as a fourth modality for the treatment of cancer. And, and there's tremendously exciting work going on. I know, I know researchers here at Imperial are, are involved looking at exciting combinations of immunotherapy, not, not just with checkpoint inhibitors, but with, with other approaches to eliciting antigen expression and uh, creating opportunities really for cancer vaccines, which have a long but not very successful history, frankly, to actually become an important part of the treatment of cancer going forward. And it is I think it's tremendously exciting to think about that prospect. As somebody coming to the problem of infectious diseases from a cancer background, I have long thought that there needed to be more crosstalk between cancer immunologists and infectious disease immunologists, and tremendously exciting things were taking place in cancer that weren't being translated into the infectious disease space. And, and, and I think there are now opportunities, and I think the network will provide those kinds of opportunities for that kind of productive crosstalk to take place, not just between immunologists, but between immunologists and clinicians and translational scientists and engineers and vaccinologists who, who you know, can bring these products to the clinic. Um, starting with, with cancer uh, and, and talking about, you know, just even slightly about the potential role of vaccines against cancer implicitly raises a, 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 the issue of changes in patterns of morbidity and mortality in modern society. Um, and there have even been some who have questioned the importance of infectious diseases uh, as, uh, you know, going forward. And it's not that we'll get rid of infectious diseases, but that they are a declining cause of morbidity and mortality in affluent societies. And I think the macro trends actually all do point in the direction of non-communicable diseases uh, you know, being in increasingly predominating as a, as a cause of, of death. Between 2000 and 2016, global mortality attributable to infectious and communicable diseases declined by almost 30 percent at a time that the global population increased by 20 percent. In affluent societies, in, in developed countries, uh, non-communicable diseases account for nine of the ten leading causes of death. It's actually only uh, in, in low-income countries, uh, in, in the 34 poorest countries in the world, which actually constitute less than 10 percent of the global population, that infectious diseases still contribute a majority of the morbidity and mortality. And even there, the, the trends are good. Global national income per capita in the poorest countries of the world has tripled over the last two decades. And life expectancy, just in 20 years, has increased by 10 years in those countries. And that's, that is largely attributable to declines 
particularly in neonatal and pediatric mortality from infectious diseases. So, so in many respects, uh, there is a very real sense in which we are winning the war against infectious diseases with the tools that we already have through the reduction of global inequities and through advances in implementation science. There is an, an apocryphal quote uh, attributed to Dr. William H. Stewart, who was the U.S. Surgeon General between 1965 and 1969 that is usually trotted out whenever anyone ventures too close to declaring victory against the microbes. Uh, Dr. Stewart, Stewart is alleged to have said, either in 1967 or 1969, depending on who's telling the story, that it is time to close the book on infectious diseases and declare the war against pestilence one. Brad Spellberg, who's done a lot of important work advocating for, to raise the profile of the problem of antimicrobial resistance, got interested in that quote. Uh, he, he, he thought it sounded suspect, so he went back and looked to see if uh, Dr. Stewart had, was ever actually recorded as having said that or, or that if we could verify that. And in fact, Dr. Stewart never made that comment. Uh, what he said, the closest that Spellberg could find, was that a speech uh, at Johns Hopkins in 1968, and I'll, I'll read this quote uh, at, at, at length. It's very interesting and, and perspicacious, I think. Um, Dr. Stewart said, powerful tools have been developed to characterize communicable diseases in man and in society, the tools of microbiology, epidemiology, and biostatistics. And the means for preventing or alleviating disease in an individual or in mass have been developed and applied. Never before in man's history has a society reached such a peak of health. Our exploitation of these scientists, sciences has just about caught up with the frontiers of public need. Clearly, he said, we cannot turn our backs on microbiology. <laughs> Certain notable gaps remain in our knowledge and capability, and maintenance of a vigilant effort will always be required. But just as clearly the characterization of health in terms of microbiology and infectious disease epidemiology cannot serve as the base for our future endeavors. Rather, the moving tides of society, which we have helped to move, are compelling us to redefine our purposes in quite different terms the terms of man's adaptation to his total environment. Dr. Stewart acknowledged the gaps in our knowledge. He advocated, espoused the need for continual vigilance against infectious diseases. And he recognized the challenge that non-communicable diseases were going to pose to an affluent society. But he presciently, probably more presciently than he realized, spoke of the need to, and just to repeat it, to redefine our purposes in, in quite different terms, the terms of man's adaptation to his total environment. And, and the rest of my, my talk, I want to focus on this and what it means for epidemic threats and what it means for the development of vaccines to address those threats. To understand the threat that infectious diseases present today, it is important important to, critical to understand them in terms of man's adaptation to his environment and his environment's adaptation to him. Forty years ago, in his book, Plagues and Peoples, uh, the historian William McNeil described the ways in which man's social and cultural evolution was influenced by and actually created enabling environments for the pool of microbial th threats that he faced. The rise of cities uh, increasing density of human populations and evolution of agriculture and animal husbandry practices created new forms of uh, new niches for, for microbes to, to fill and, and for what McNeil called the, the so-called civilized disease pools uh, to merge over time as, as trade networks and, and transportation improved and forms of civilizational exchange took root as, as human societies developed and evolved. What McNeil argued was that between the second century BC and the second century AD, as, as societies, the Indus River civilization, China, Rome, began to commingle and intermingle, they actually created opportunities for pandemic diseases to emerge. And the first known pandemics actually occurred beginning around the second century 
AD, and ultimately, at least with respect to Rome, had had uh, a, a significant impact on uh, the collapse of Mediterranean civilization. That much has, has long been well established and I think accepted. McNeil was arguing from Darwinian principles in proposing that microbes had adapted to man's environment and that man's environment had created these opportunities. Eska Willerslav, a scientist at, uh, in Copenhagen and at Cambridge, uh, and colleagues actually have now been able to demonstrate how one of the most fearsome pathogens, bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis, actually evolved and adapted itself to its human host um, in a way that actually facilitated the pathogenesis of the disease plague that we know now and also created uh, opportunities offered by mankind's new urban agrarian lifestyle and his uh, commensal relationship with rats and fleas over time. What, he, what they were able to do in reconstructing um, Yersinia pestis genomes uh, going back almost 5,000 years, they showed these adaptations uh, in the plasminogen activator gene and in a, a, a flagellar frame shift mutation that allowed plague to adapt to the human, um, to evade the human immune system. And importantly, they showed the emergence around 1,000 BC of a, uh, a, a mutation, a gene in the Yersinia murine toxin gene that actually facilitates survival of Yersinia pestis in the flea gut. It took human society almost 1,200 years or maybe even 1,500 years um, to evolve to a point where these adaptations could erupt in pandemic disease that literally spread all over the world. Similarly, um, it is anything but an accident that the great childhood diseases that we have inherited from antiquity um, have extremely high reproductive numbers but very long generation times. These, this is a perfect adaptation to a more sparsely populated world with population centers that were few and far between where the population centers were barely large enough to sustain chains of transmission the fact that these generation times were so long is adapted to a, a, a human population moving at the speed of foot or horse or hoof or sail to, to move between population centers and to keep these transmission chains um, going. These diseases, if we didn't have vaccines, these diseases would find the modern world easy pickings. Um, but. Uh, and, and, and we know that from the impact that they had on American Indian civilizations when those populations first encountered those diseases and were essentially decimated, almost completely wiped out by these diseases in the 16th century. In the past few centuries, we've created a, a very different world with people moving faster, with, with you know, exponential growth of populations, with increasingly intensive agricultural practices. Uh, that have created opportunities for diseases. I think what we should be asking ourselves are what kinds of microbes will, will thrive in the environments that we have created. I think in the first place, commensals uh, will, will thrive. Bacteria that live on or within us and that thrive in environments like hospitals that we have created. In the second place, we have actually eliminated, in, in, in the most affluent societies, we've reduced the risk of exposure to contaminated water. We've reduced the risk of exposure to parasites with the exception really of mosquitoes. Mosquito-borne diseases will, will thrive in this environment. I think the global spread of chikungunya, Zika, and dinghy over, over the last couple of decades demonstrates the potential <coughs> that, that mosquito-borne illnesses have in, in our current society. In the third place, viruses with biological parameters that are suited <coughs> to the modern age. Um, I think influenza and HIV represent the paradigmatic plagues of modernity. They are, they are actually alike in many important ways. They, they are both highly mutable viruses. They have both evolved mechanisms for evading the human immune response. They are both, in terms of their mechanisms of pathogenesis and transmission, they are, are suited to their generation intervals and their reproductive numbers, and both have run rampant in the modern world. From the perspective of my role at CEPI, the biological prototype exemplified by influenza, a disease 
with a very short generation time and a moderate reproductive number is vastly more concerning to me in terms of the types of problem that I'm trying to solve than a disease like HIV, which has a very long incubation period and generation time. We have created a socially interconnected world that imposes few constraints on viruses with such characteristics. Such a virus, because the world is, is so interconnected, because no spot is more than 24 hours from any other spot on the globe, such a virus could enter the, the global microbial traffic almost anywhere and spread rapidly. And because of, through the climate change that we have caused, the incursion into previously remote areas that are occurring, the agricultural practices that I have mentioned, um, we, we have created vast opportunities for the microbial world to evolve and adapt to these, these threats to our environment, not to credit nature with the ingenuity to devise life forms that can thrive in ambient conditions would be, I think, a tragic and terrible mistake. We are actually seeing evidence over the last 30 years of an increase in the number of emerging diseases and an increase in the diversity of viral species and a decline in diversity, actually, of bacterial species. Uh, or in terms of the number of species that actually cause major outbreaks. Let me move to two quick examples. Um, we know that the microbes will try again and again and again to emerge. The history of Ebola is, is a history of small outbreaks in remote locations until Ebola made its way to West Africa, emerged in the social milieu that had been characterized by civil conflict, public distrust of, of, of uh, government authorities and exploded and rapidly exceeded the global public response capacity, public health response capacity. Another frightening, much smaller example, in, in India this spring in Kerala there was an outbreak of Nipah. Uh, it was rapidly contained because, because it emerged in a, in, a, in, a, in a very sophisticated medical environment where they rapidly implemented textbook containment. What is scary about this is that Nipah, which was first identified in Malaysia in 1999 um, and had previously, there had been multiple outbreaks in Bangladesh and in northeast India, had never emerged in South India. That's almost 2,500 kilometers from the next nearest known outbreak of Nipah. And what was really scary about, about this outbreak, in Malaysia there was very limited, maybe just a couple of cases of human-to-human -human transmission among 240 cases. 1999, there had been human-to-human -human transmission in Bangladesh, but always at, at comparatively limited numbers. This case was characterized by a super spreading event. The index case infected 19 people in the 30 hours that he was being treated in the medical care system before he died. And Nipah, is a zoonotic disease carried by Taropus fruit bats, and the range of the Taropus fruit bats is, is characterized by the green line there. So they're, and, and so we've now had Nipah in South India, Northeast India, Bangladesh, Malaysia, a closely related disease in Northeast Australia. That's a huge geographic range providing an opportunity to Nipah to continue to evolve, to, to further develop this, this ability to spread human to human uh, between humans and uh, potentially to cause, you know, outbreaks that have already spun out of control by the time they are recognized. So what are the roles of vaccines and of organizations like CEPI and, and the network here at Imperial in protecting humanity against such threats? Fourteen years ago, in the wake of the SARS epidemic, researchers here at Imperial, uh, Chris Frazier, Stephen Riley, Roy Anderson, Neil Ferguson, published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that, that I think is actually a seminal paper. In this paper, Neil and his colleagues sought to identify general properties of emerging infectious agents that determine the likely success of the immediately available public health intervention, isolation of cases, tracing and quarantine of their contacts in terms of controlling diseases. And they identified that the degree of transmission occurring prior to or in the absence of symptoms um, and implicitly the generation interval to the extent that short intervals um, you know, 
result in relative delays in the isolation of cases and make contact tracing almost impossible uh, as the most important factors determining whether such measures, isolation and quarantine, can be successful. And in doing so, they defined boundaries beyond which countermeasures, principally vaccines, will almost certainly be required if epidemic containment is to be achieved. To my mind, the, the, the paper's signal contribution was the analytical rigor that it brought to defining this problem and to defining what would be needed to control disease. From the distance of a decade and a half, we can quibble with some of their assumptions about parameters and inputs, but their main finding is sound. And the factors the authors identify do determine when vaccines are going to be necessary for purposes of containment. In the real world, there will be other cases where vaccines may not be absolutely necessary. I think Ebola is a great example, but where they will be very highly desirable. Um, the outbreaks in West Africa demonstrated the fragile limits of the world's global public health response capacity. And it is actually the reason that CEPI was created um, was because of the recognition that it was tragic that an effective vaccine which had already been developed was not available to be deployed into, into the outbreak. Vaccines, even for diseases where they are not absolutely necessary, but particularly for diseases with high mortality rates, vaccines will be especially useful to the extent that they can protect frontline workers uh, and healthcare providers and engage the community and promote care-seeking behaviors. As I said, it was, it was the experience of Ebola that uh, prompted global public health leaders to establish CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. We are a coalition of public sector funders, private sector partners, academics, civil society partners. We are all of whom are committed to making progress against these grave epidemic diseases. Our vision is actually a world in which epidemics are no longer a threat to humanity, and our specific mission is to accelerate the development of vaccines. Initially, we are supporting the development of vaccines against a set of threats that we know, MERS, Lhasa, and Nipah. And we are also working to address what WHO has called disease X. That's the disease we don't know, the disease that has yet to emerge. For the diseases that we know, MERS, Lhasa, and Nipah, these are diseases where markets are not driving vaccine development. There is no demand for vaccines against these products. We know that there are are promising early stage candidates. There is no funding to carry these candidates across the so-called valley of death. And CEPI was set up to provide that funding, to provide that support, to create linkages between vaccine developers, countries at risk, regulators, WHO, um, and to help bring these products forward. We are also supporting the development of rapid response capabilities. This is for disease X. Um, if the next disease X is both highly lethal and transmissible, the technologies that we have today will be inadequate. The need for speed in developing and manufacturing vaccines will be urgent. The last disease X to emerge, Zika, emerged in early 2016. Almost three years later, we still do not have a vaccine that is even available for emergency use, much less a licensed vaccine. That is simply unacceptable. The problem, the reason we don't have a Zika vaccine, the reason we don't have the platform capabilities that we need is that the kinds of speed that are critical for rapid response, speed in developing candidate vaccines, vaccines speed in eliciting immunity, speed in scaling manufacturing capacity are not attributes that matter to the vaccine consuming public. Under normal circumstances, which obtain, obviously, most of the time, there is no reason for consumers to value the speed with which a vaccine is produced. This is why cell-based influenza vaccines and recombinant flu vaccines have had such a difficult time entering the market. They cost more to manufacture. They cost the consumer more. And unless you have an egg allergy, there is no reason to prefer those vaccines to egg-based vaccines, which have comparable efficacy and are a whole lot cheaper. 
this is where, coming back to, to the discussion around cancer vaccines, where you need to develop the vaccine very, very rapidly. This is where cancer vaccines, public health emergency preparedness requirements, the mission of CEPI, and the work of the new center, or our network rather, here at Imperial can converge to promote disruptive innovation. In Clayton Christensen's well-known account, innovations that prove to be truly disruptive often emerge by meeting the needs of niche consumers, niche markets. They usually, typically, actually are not as good as mainstream products in addressing mainstream needs, but by meeting the needs of those niche markets, they actually um, receive revenue they, and investment that allow them to improve their characteristics. They advance technologically by addressing the particular needs of those niche markets. Um, and I think this is actually a, a very interesting way of looking at where we are today in the development in, of capabilities to develop vaccines rapidly. And I, I, our, our need for speed for new techniques for antigen identification, candidate vaccine development, for continuous manufacturing, for process intensification, for flexible manufacturing facilities, for scalable technologies, all the things that we will need if we're going to be able to respond quickly to an emerging infectious disease um, are facilitated um, because we have an organization, CEPI, that's willing to fund these developments and we have networks like the network here at Imperial that can bring the, the disparate groups of scientists, engineers, um, and investigators together to develop these, these uh, I entitled my talk, Ending Epidemics in Our Time, but have spoken mainly about why they will persist. CEPI's vision of ending epidemics in our time does not presume that vaccines alone will bring this about, though they will be critical tools in preventing outbreaks of certain diseases from becoming epidemics. Ending epidemics in our time, a much larger problem, will require <coughs> such tools but it will also require concerted political will and collective action. I've been thinking a lot since joining CEPI about what we can learn from other acute crises that humanity has faced from time to time. Famines, in particular, are of interest in this regard. It used to be the case that famines, like plagues, were viewed as acts of God, visitations that happened from time to time and that were when they came nearly an unstoppable force. Today, famines are viewed differently. They are viewed as having political causes and they are susceptible to concerted public action. Today, no one should die of famine anywhere, and in fact, few do. None of the extensive shortfalls identified by the Food and Agricultural Organization over the past decade have resulted in a famine. Europe suffered its last famine in Moldova in 1946. The last famine unrelated to conflict occurred in Bangladesh more than 40 years ago. That is because a combination of adequate early warnings, economic and societal resilience, and the globalization of disaster relief. It is only famines caused by war and, and conflict that still put the lives of millions at risk. Today, the best guarantees against famine are prosperity and peace. That is true also of epidemics. The difference is that a person fleeing a famine does not carry the famine with them. Epidemic diseases, on the contrary, present global security risks, as we saw in Dallas during the, with Ebola and in South Korea in 2015 with MERS. This is another reason that it is imperative to stop them in their tracks and stop them early. We cannot prevent every death from every emerging disease, but I do believe that we can prevent outbreaks from becoming epidemics. We can prevent such diseases from becoming global security threats. In closing, I don't think it's whether we can. I think it is whether, as a society, we make the choice to do so. Thank you.